Carl Hartman knows how to grow and scale businesses from scratch. In fact, he's one of Australia's leading serial entrepreneurs, having taken his first idea to Mando to over 80,000 users, 3 billion transactions, and over $55 million in funding. And today, he shares his five tips for growing and scaling your business. It's a wheel and dealin' episode 463 of the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show, thanks to Authentic Education, Yellow, and American Express. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls. To take your marketing straight to the lead, now here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing magnificence. I'm your host, Timbo Reed. You, infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you're ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. Today's episode 463, it's made possible thanks to digital marketing agency Yellow, American Express business cards, which are designed for small business owners just like you to manage their cash flow, and Marketing Educators Authentic Education. More on a fantastic event they've got coming up later. Hey, big show today. We meet up with one of Australia's most successful entrepreneurs in Carl Hartman, who besides sharing the ups and downs of his entrepreneurial journey, shares his top five tips to scale your business. Yeah, your business personally yours. A highly motivated listener who, I love this, who leaves for work 30 minutes early each morning to listen to this show, he's got to get a life, that boy, wins over $1,000 worth of prizes in in this week's Monster Prize Draw. And I've got some really good news about next week's guest who's making a mozza, having invented something recently that you would swear should have been invented like 100 years ago. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Righto, let's get stuck in today's special guest. Carl Hartman is a prominent, multi-award winning Australian entrepreneur, best known for his work as the co-founder and CEO of Tomando, 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 Potato, Potato, which he took from an idea to one of Australia's largest technology companies. It's an incredible story. Having exited Tomando in 2017, Carl now spends his time looking for the next big thing, investing in companies that make him sit up and take notice. And he talks about what he looks for when looking for the next big thing. In fact, he's the co-founder of Liars Non-Alcoholic Spirits. Remember we interviewed founder Mark Livings a couple of weeks ago? Well, Carl's a part of that. So strap in. Because he is about to share the ups and downs of an incredible entrepreneurial journey so far and give us top five, his top five tips on how to scale a business just like yours. And every now and then, I've got to say, he bamboozles me with some tech talk that's way, way, way above my head. That's all right. You'll get it. So without further ado, let's meet serial entrepreneur Carl Hartman. Carl Hartman, welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, amongst other business titles, I see you are the adjunct professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at the University of Queensland. So does that make you like a modern day Dumbledore? (laughs) I definitely don't have any magic powers, no. (laughs) But, uh, you know, perhaps my superpower is like, you know, commercial models and, uh, you know, helping inspiring students. I I seem to be pretty good at that. (laughs) What is an adjunct professor? Uh, Look, um, yeah, so this is a random story. Often, you know, as you get later in your career and you've kicked a few goals, uh, it's not uncommon for universities to reach out to alumni uh, that might have some interesting stories from the real world to tell. So uh, I think the the technical way is when it says adjunct, it means you can't be paid. Uh, so. Okay, right. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's like an honorary title. So You, um, you sit alongside the professor that yeah, is so getting paid. Yeah, so it's actually the same academic, academic rank as a, as a paid professor. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's basically you've earned it through life merit versus, uh, you know, academic study and research. When, when you were asked to be it, did you hesitate? Um, no, because look, um, I'd 
gone and done a couple of sort of guest lectures and uh, the feedback was was pretty positive. And um, I think they tried to find a way to, uh, you know, get you back involved in the community and uh, obviously giving someone uh, um, a title that recognises what they've done, um, you know, because that helps command the respect from students sure. and things like that. So, so you say, uh, and I don't want you to be humble in this interview, <laughs> I know humility is just not part of your shtick, so like, just <laughs> open up. You say you're great at inspiring Young people who are coming through, how? Why do you yeah, think look, that? No, I'll, I'll put that in co- my comment in context. Um, you know, uh, when we look, so when I started my entrepreneurial journey, um, to be honest, there wasn't much here in Queensland. Uh, you know, there was no venture capital. There was, you know, no accelerators. There was no, um, you know, mentoring structures. This, um, this last year? <laughs> no, this is this is. <laughs> This is going back um, oh, really like, you know, 2006 to 2008 when I started to sort of explore things. So um, there wasn't even LinkedIn really. Um, that had, I, th- I think that was maybe launched, but definitely no one was using it. Um, so really the only way you could, I guess, you know, start was hard work and hustle. So I remember back then literally getting the BRW fast growing list one day and just started ringing people and coming up with all sorts of charades of, uh, you know, sometimes I was pretending to return their call. Other times it was, uh, <laughs> like that one. you know, oh, he knows who this is about. And um, would you believe about 50% of the people I called actually felt the thing was pretty funny and gave me time. Yeah. Uh, and I always invited, you know, tried to buy them lunch. Yeah, um, yeah. And realistically, it's, you know, when you're starting out, you have no idea. So I figured try to find the, the people that are actually doing it would be a good way to learn. What, what were you looking for from those calls? Just pick their brain. And, and, and this is day one for me. And um, I hadn't had any real sort of entrepreneurial business experience. In some cases, it was questions like, you know, how do you uh, structure an employee share plan? In other cases, um, you know, it might be like, um, how, did, how did you raise money and when did you raise money and how did you value the business? Uh, all these things that get way easier as you get on in your career um, are very hmm. difficult to do. Um, you know, at the uh, the early stage. You're out there hustling and asking. Do, yeah. Do you think, well, entrepreneur did used to be a dirty word. Uh, it's almost like only the last decade, maybe two, that it's become kind of de rigueur. Yeah. Do you but, think it's now overused? No, I th- oh, well. I think an entrepreneur is a pretty big spectrum, right? Yeah, like, big. Uh, you know, um, I think w- most people have the potential to be an entrepreneur and, you know, we probably, there's probably some type of entrepreneurial spectrum, right? Where, no doubt. you know, there's, there's ones that will take, and it's probably linked to risk as well. I mean, how much risk are you willing to take? Cause w- what is an entrepreneur? Look, I, I think it's, it, I like this, you know, the, the saying that, um, you know, if you give, uh, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, two rocks and a piece of wood, they'll build you an oven. Uh, you know, everyone else probably just <laughs> some some rocks and wood yeah so, like that. <laughs> so look i think it's the ability to create something out of nothing um you give someone the building blocks and they can li- literally create industries around ideas uh, in some cases are they risk takers yeah like it, it it comes with the territory so i think going back to your you know to your your earlier question um yeah uh oh, what's really needed uh in any entrepreneurial ecosystem is um you know you can't sort of understate the knowledge of those that have done it before and i can safely say from my career if those people early in my career didn't give time uh i would have not have any sad success i would have failed miserably because mm-hmm. sometimes it's just you know you just don't know what you don't know right mm. so um to me that helped like immensely and i said to myself at the time if i ever had any sort of privilege of success i just think there's a real obligation to pay that forward uh so i think you know to, to cover the whole university arc um you know when i was asked i was like actually i think this is a really good forum in order to say you know here's a brain download of everything i learned mm-hmm. and it's just about to be honest it's uh it's just about as much as about the mistakes as it is the successes no doubt um, I've definitely learnt more from from mistakes than I have success. But so, uh, so, so Carl, you're ringing around, and we'll talk about those very shortly. But you're ringing around, you're asking people just a whole lot of questions about running a business, identifying an idea, how do you launch something, everything, employee payroll, share schemes, everything. Hundred percent. At yeah. that point. Do you have a business idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- at this point, this is when I was launching Tomando. And uh, look, some of the people that um, – that, uh, What written... was Tomando? Explain to me. Oh, yeah. So, so my, my first startup was um, was a, an e-commerce logistics um, SaaS business called Tomando. Um, to date, it's been one of the larger ones to come out of um, uh, Queensland. And um, basically, if you've bought something online, you've got to the checkout, you've seen a whole bunch of deliri- delivery options, you know, one day, two day, three day free shipping. Uh, that doesn't happen by magic. There's quite a lot of science that goes into that. And uh, 
essentially built a platform that um, helped figure that out for the retailers. And if they're offering things like free shipping, make sure it's profitable. And uh, if they're offering premium delivery experiences, making sure it's possible. Because uh, there's no, nothing worse than promising someone, uh, you know, a three-hour delivery and, uh, you know, it comes in two days. Mm. Um, you've probably lost that customer yes. for life. <laughs> so Tomando was a white label kind of bit of so- technology that oh, sat look, behind those websites? So, uh, E-commerce from, site? Yeah, I mean, it's not a branded thing in a retailer's cart. It's just sort of like a payment gateway in a way where, you know, it's behind the scenes making things happen. But, um, you know, not really, a con- I guess, a consumer. It's, so a, B- it's I, a B2B I, play versus a consumer-facing sort of product. Okay. Because yeah. we had James Chin Moody on the show a couple of weeks ago from Sendal. Yeah. So he's he's a consumer facing. Yeah. So like the... we actually started with a similar model. Um, right. You know, or, or more so you could say Sender was inspired by Tomando because we were, you know, um, we, we we came definitely first. But yeah. uh, we actually pivoted away from that because um, you know you can get a lot of growth pretty early on. Um, but um, if you want to go for bigger customers, and that was sort of our, we were very good at that at uh, the enterprise side of the market. So um, uh, increasingly, as we looked to go further up the value chain. Um, we ended up being completely focused on software. But uh, yeah, I mean, the roots of the business was actually, we started with, um, I guess, small businesses and uh, uh, being a bit of a comparison site. But where we kind of ended up, you know, it was enterprise SaaS. Uh, so I think as we did that, it sort of paved way for others that wanted to focus on that particular niche, like Sendal, and they've done really well. Uh, Demando was a huge success for you, Carl. Where, where did it get to in the end? You, you've you're no longer involved? No, no. So I exited in uh, 2017. Yeah. Um, so basically, I guess our- Give us a sense. Scope know, it out. Come the on. entrepreneurial story was, uh, you know, we did a million seed. Uh, we did a five series A, a 50 series B, and then exited by way of a trade sale to a, uh, a listed strategic out of France in, in 2017. I have no idea what you just said there, but it sounded <laughs> really, really impressive. Ho- hopefully your <laughs> listeners will. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, um, o- often when people talk about, you know, series, it's just the order of w- in which capital comes. Right. Um, you know, we, we raised capital at a time where there wasn't really much venture capital. Um, and again, it was, it was uh, you know, um, hard work and hustle that got there. Um, you know, our, our early investors, some of them were the people I had literally picked up the phone to and asked for wow. advice. And uh, some of them later on did contribute to our sort of, you know, first sort of structured round um, and uh, and so forth. But um, So yeah. Tomando, the sale of exiting of Tomando has allowed you now to really become a serial entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. I tried doing nothing for a little bit. Um, for that, how long? Uh, that didn't even last 12 weeks, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but it'd be fair to say your attention span is, <laughs> how would you measure your attention span? Is there a unit you would have come up oh, with a unit? No, no, no. Like, it's a small unit. No, to, to be honest, it depends what's needed. <laughs> right. Um, like I you can, can I can be at an absolute minute level of detail when needed. Really? Uh, but uh, – to be honest, I think my my value to people is probably you know strategic thinking, thinking outside the box. Uh, when when yeah. I first met you, I was emceeing <laughs> a job for Shortlister, which we'll talk about shortly. Another one of your investments, and um, uh, it was the first job. I think it was in Brisbane. You were sitting in the front row. I think I hadn't <laughs> met you prior to it. Maybe maybe I just said hello, but you're sitting there and you're on your phone. I'm thinking. This guy's either not interested in the startup that he's about to launch or he has a very short attention span. It turned out you were actually notes. taking notes yeah, for yeah, the yeah. speech you were going to make at the end, but uh, I get it. Well, Tim, Tw- if I'm doing a wrap-up, I, I should probably take a few of, of, of the uh, gems that uh, our absolutely. fantastic panellists gave us that Correct. time. Correct. Uh, 12 weeks of doing that. No- what did you do? Uh, look, to be honest, I was did, did you? Sorry, I must have, did you just rub your hands together? And go, I've got a whole lot of dough now. I'm not going. I'm just going to live the life. I, I, this is going to be like the Queensland's answer to entourage. Well, no, because uh, I, I was living in San Francisco, and uh, part of that was, um, you know, sort of had decided post exit was going to sort of pack up and, and come back to Australia. Um, so yeah, basically, that twelve weeks was largely, you know, just. Uh, you know, winding okay. down okay. and starting to think about, you know, where I'm going to live in Australia and, yep. uh, and so forth. And because, um, you know, it was a great experience living and working in the US for, um, for a period of time. But, no uh, you know, what, what's, the, what's the Australian saying? The grass isn't always greener when you have to mow someone else's yard. Like, um, <laughs> you know, certainly um, spending a bit of time in the US. Um, it's an amazing country with lots of opportunity, but uh, there's a lot of things you come back to Australia appreciating. Um, you know, things like healthcare and safety. Yes. I mean, you know, um, it, it almost seems um, uh, we take it for granted and then you, you see how it can be in other places and you're like, you know what, I'm never going to complain about Medicare again. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair <laughs> enough. Carl, what changed for you when you came into a whole lot of dough after exiting uh, to Mando? Yeah, well, I, th- I think the, the, the main thing is you start to think about what other problems do you want to solve. Um, if I reflect on my Tomando experience, the, the biggest challenge, honestly, was, uh, was growing and scaling around people. 
Um, so, you know, and at different stages, it's different challenges. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the first 50 people, you're probably, you know, you know, you you put a job out of and seek, you you know, you'll get a hundred resumes, you read them over a week, uh, uh, the weekend and through luck or skill, you hopefully find someone that's going to be a, a fit. And, um, you know, there's probably a degree of founder's intuition that you hopefully get it right more often than not, but, um, sometimes you get it spectacularly wrong. And uh, I'll be honest, I made a couple of really bad hires Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, was quite, I'll say just, you know, could have had a a really dire impact to the business. But, um, you know, you learn from those and go, okay, what did I do wrong and how could I have done it better? So there was another person I went to university with that pitched me an idea about, you know, using data and science to basically, um, you know, optimize hiring. And I was like, oh, geez, I wish that existed the last sort of 10 years in my, my hmm. career. And then as I spoke to other CEOs, they were like, this oh, needs to exist. Um, and, you know, everyone's got iterations of the problem. And sometimes they don't get enough candidates. So they get like 20 through the door and they have a two-day window and speed to hire problem. So if, if they don't jump on that then and there, um, they kind of miss that, um, you know, that uh, – uh, that that higher because they're in so much mm-hmm. demand they get scooped up by someone. So you solve this problem? Um, yeah, or well, solving? It's solving. Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a uh, I guess an evolving space. Mm. But um, I think when we when we coined shortlisted, the idea was you know if we could use data science and AI to basically match skills, qualification, and culture mm-hmm. with a big emphasis on the culture because you know if you think about when someone reads a resume, you, you can make an inference rightly or wrongly about how they might be a fit with their skills and their and their uh, and their qualifications. What's not on a resume? is the soft skills, someone's personality. And it's funny because we often will hire for skills and qualifications, but we'll fire for culture. Mm. So, and then you think about, I I think about some, um, one example is there was a guy I hired in the US and uh, previously before working with us, he came from the Coast Guard, but he he had such a high emotional intelligence. He presented so well. He was hungry. You know, he was junior and definitely needed to invest in training, but you know, he ended up becoming, you know, one of our best sales guys. And uh, now he's actually working for Afterpay over there. Nah. And, um, you know, and he's done ex- exceptionally well there as well. So, you know. Um, so, so you basically, just to wrap that, that's shortlist. So that's one of your new investments. Yeah. Uh, one of you, you're a co-founder of that business. Co-founder and chairman, um, that's right. And chairman. So w- upon selling, just exiting to Mando, you did kind of, I imagine, get pitched a lot. I was talking to Andrew Banks about this a few weeks ago. And he too, like it's, I'm surprised he only gets, he said like three or four pitches a week. I would have thought it'd be a whole lot more. But is that what started to happen to you when it's like Carl's a guy who can yeah, make things happen? Yeah, I think it's a combination of some people pitch you and sometimes, you know, you meet founders and you're like, oh, they're really investable uh, people. And, right. Uh, you know, you, I think it's for me when, when I make an investment, it's probably 50% the founder yes. and 50% the idea. And digging on the idea, it's about, you know, what's the addressable, how big's the addressable market? You know, what's the unit economics of the business? Um, you know, is there some evidence that, um, you know, they can meet the claim? So mm. if, you, if, you know, if you might say, hey, well, potentially I can sell a billion, a billion widgets. Um, and if we can make $10 a widget, we can make $10 billion. At the end of the day, if you can't even convince one person to buy a widget, well, it's, um, you know, it, 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 it might be a nice thesis, but it may not be able to be proven. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, yeah, so it, a combination, sometimes it's people pitching. Sometimes it's like randomly I get involved in things, you know, I, I might be trying to contact them as a customer. Like uh, I invested in a Swedish electric wakeboard company uh, literally because I, I saw the, the thing, well, my mum sent it to me. She's saying, oh, you might be interested in one of these. And I contact them about buying one. And, uh, you know, like any sort of, you know, sort of uh, expensive toy process uh, purchase, you want to try it before you um, you buy it. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, there's none in Australia. But if you happen to be in Europe, you could, you know, come to our office and try one. And then just as luck had it, like I was going to London the following week, I said, yeah, cool. I'll just get a stop over a in uh, in Sweden, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll, uh, I'll I'll get off in Copenhagen. I'll catch the train across. Apparently, it's forty minutes. Got to love Europe with high speed transport. <laughs> and uh, road one, I said, well, if, if I can like, and I said, oh, how cold's it going to be? And they're like, oh, not <laughs> yeah, that cold. Yeah. All the ice is melted. <laughs> and I was like, so it was, um, in fairness, it was six degrees. I wore a dry suit with thermals underneath. Um, it was so cold it hurt my bones. Uh, and but if I figured if I could have fun in freezing cold water. Uh, in the nice warm water of Noosa, um, it's going to be a hell of a lot more. Yeah, fun, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's another little business you got. Yeah, so that was uh, you know uh, one that uh, I started spending time with the founders. Uh, I just like the business. Mm. Um, so uh, your criteria really is uh, for investing is either you like the founders, you can see how in- an investable founder, as you talk about, uh, whether there's a market for it and they can yeah. actually deliver on what they're believe promising. In it too. Uh, I've got to believe in the product. I've got to be able to evangelize it and add value. Yes. Um, so in this case, I love water sports. I grew up wakeboarding. Um, you know, you can't always, like, 
you know, if you want to go wakeboarding, it's a three person activity, right? Yes. Um, you can't just do that on a, on a moment's notice uh, in the morning when you wake up and go, Oh, it's warm and uh, there's no wind. Let's go. Yeah. So being able to, um, you know, take yourself skiing. I thought that's a cool thesis. So, but, are you a guy who operates from a gut feeling? I mean, I imagine you would really analyze things and want to see the data and all that stuff. But... Yeah. It's funny. I, I, if you asked me that question 10 years ago, it would have been a hundred percent gut. I, I definitely use a lot more data Dut. these days. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I've done those like Myers-Briggs tests and I, I was I was once a very hard ENFJ and now I'm an ENTJ. So the difference, the F means feeling, the T means thinking. And nice. uh, yeah, I think I, I definitely need data to su- support my intuition. But if I had to make a call, I'll generally go with gut. <laughs> You've had a great career. So if I want to get to talking about the five learnings on how to grow and scale a business, we've got a lot of small business owners listening, Carl. Before we do that, highest point of your career? Like that one moment where you have punched the air so hard, you know, it hurt. And that oh. low and that low point where you've gone, you've just shook your head and you've gone, is yeah. it maybe I'm better off as an employee? No, so look, I think some of the high points, um, one of the, the things I, I got a lot of value from and, uh, you know, it's good to get, I guess, social proof is I went through the IBM um, Global Entrepreneur of the Year program. Um, and that's, uh, you know, it's sort of a... A, a global search they you you pitch low like um uh, within your country then within a region and uh, i got to runner up with that globally um nice so there was um some regional finals here in australia then um the i guess we we're in the rest of the world category australia uh so that those uh semi-finals were in uh istanbul and then um and then the grand finals in san francisco i mean that was just cool because um going through that program uh in multiple countries um, you know, the, the, the judges and the mentors are a combination of entrepreneurs, investors, and academics. Yeah. And yeah, you, you get such uh, interesting insights into your, your business and how to pitch it. Sometimes, particularly, you know, Turkey was interesting because we were pitching to a whole bunch of mentors that English wasn't their first language. And I tell you what, you learn how to sharpen that up <laughs> no quick doubt. in those environments. So no doubt. That was definitely... So was the, then the low point of your career coming second? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that, that was... Uh, Definitely one where, you know, we, we didn't use any IBM tech and you're like, uh, yeah, right. is this legit? But yeah. um, I thought my pitch was pretty bloody good. But, well, um, as Will Ferrell's character says in, um, what is it, Talladega Nights, I think he says, if you're not first, you're last. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, 100%. But, you know. Second's pretty good. I, I tell you what, you know, and uh, hi- history is actually filled with examples of second movers that end up winning. So yes. you know, think, think about this. I mean, when I was in university, the coolest phone was the Nokia with the blue screen, Yes, right? Nokia was one of the most valuable companies in the world, like a darling stock, 70-something percent market share. A couple of years later, this thing called the iPhone came out and everything changed. And, you know, that was probably the moment where Apple just really started to, to skyrocket. Or uh, going back further, when I was in high school, there was a search engine called Alta Vista. Do you oh, remember I Alta do Vista? remember Alta Vista, yes. And it was like Russian roulette of search. You yeah. just type it in. Sometimes you get something you shouldn't see. Other times, you know, it's com- something completely uh, irrelevant. Yeah. Other times, it's actually what you wanted to see. But um, then Google came out. And if you know the Google story, there was multi- like Yahoo passed on buying it, all these sort of things. And, you know, now you've got some of these examples. And, they're, you know, they're trillion-dollar companies. So it's amazing to see that... It's not always the first mover that wins. Well, I imagine the first mover <laughs> often kind of is paving the way and, yeah. and you know, it has to incur the mistakes and, you know, the de- the pitfalls. Yeah. Whereas the second time around... There's, there's a great saying that says it's, um, you know, the first mover paves the uh, uh, creates the roads that get paved over in the process. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Lowest point? Uh, look... Um, Maybe there's not one. No, there definitely are. Uh, you just try to think what's the, what's the most relevant one for listeners. Look, probably, um, you know, one that I reflect upon a lot was um, I made a really bad hire in, in my Tomando story. Um, you know, I was a senior executive, looked amazing on paper. It was the classic, looks right, but a uh, week in, something just didn't feel right. It was... Uh, you're like, oh, I don't think this is going to work out. And I went to my board and they're like, oh, Carl, you can be impulsive. Maybe just give it a bit of time. Three months later, we just absolutely knew it was not the right oh. fit. So Nearly um, brought the company down? Yeah, yeah. It was that 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 um, uh, that dry us and, um, you know, created a bit of a, an us and th- us versus them cultural divide. When, you know, you're a sort of a sub 100 person company, um, you know, that that's a pretty hard thing to deal yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. You know, like anything, you know, you learn from your your, uh, your lesson, and to be honest, that was part of the inspiration for uh, for Shortlister. I should say too, uh, last week's or two, I guess two weeks ago, was Mark Living's oh, from yeah, Mark. from Liars, yeah, uh, which you are a co-founder of. That's right. Yeah. What what attracted? I mean, Mark, I, I met Mark at one of your events. Uh, clearly, like, what a character! <laughs> yeah, he yeah, knows Mark, branding awesome. and marketing back, backwards. He's charismatic. He's yeah. 
completely believes in lies. What did you love about lies? Yeah, so look, um, so when I came back to Australia, I joined um, Mark's board at Brandlink, which is um, uh, an, um, um, one of Mark's other uh, businesses. Uh, ironically, when I actually co-founded that one with him as well. It started off to be a, a joint venture between oh, really? um, uh, Tomando and his agency at the time, Kinetic. Uh, but you know, my board said, "Oh, that's a distraction, Carl." And now it's one of the fastest growing businesses, mm, um, okay. you know, in Australia in its own right. But um, um, one, one, one sort of meeting, he had some samples uh, on the boardroom table, and he's like, "Try this," and I was like, "Wow, that, that oh, you know, tastes like a t- t- tastes like a Jack Daniels." And he's like, "Yeah, it's non-alcoholic." And I was like, "No." And then I tried the gin, and I was like, "Wow, can we can we, can we make a gin and tonic?" And we did, and I was like this is next level. And then I I guess um, he started giving me some of the background about how, you know, lots of millennials are making healthier choices. Uh, You know, you've got people that have grown up um, over time and now they've, um, you know, they drink a lot less in in their their more mature years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, and he gave me the background and how he was sort of telling a lot of his com- his um, customers of Brandlink saying, hey, this, this non-alcoholics is, is going to be a massive trend. And not, every, not everyone was sort of taking it that seriously. And I reflected on my own uh, journey and um, sort of, you know, there was one year I traveled 500,000 miles. Uh, I did 230 days of travel. And um, you go from conference to social event to social event. And honestly, the, the booze, you pack on quite a bit of weight. No doubt. And, you know, you get to a point and you go, I just can't keep doing that. And also some of the places where, um, you know, it, there, there is like a, uh, it's intertwined with the socialization. So places mm-hmm. like London, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I go there and people want to have like, you know, four pints in a row every night. I mm. just physically can't do it. So for me, it's like, I know my limits um, and, you know, Often I'll just drink a water, but you know you get the weird looks and uh, yeah, so love it. There's only so much water you can drink in a night too, right? So <laughs> Correct. Um, I, I guess I, I so therefore I, lies is a winner. Yeah. So I, I just thought you know um, I've had millennials that work for me. I know people up here in Noosa uh, that you know just don't drink anymore mm. because you know they're making healthy lifestyle choices. I see different. It goes back to that addressable market thing, right? Yes. Where you can see the addressable market is big and growing. Um, and you know, my own personal circumstances is like, Hey, if, if I had an alternative, I would definitely consume this product. So again, mm. I can evangelize it. So it. yeah, I see immense opportunities with lies. One of the many reasons I do this show is to help your business get found online, which is a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. Your business is the needle and the haystack is the internet. So why not improve your chances of getting found by listing on Yellow Online, Australia's number one online directory receiving over 5.2 million searches every month by people looking for stuff, stuff that possibly you sell. Like I'm guessing with that many searches, there'd have to be at the very least a handful of peeps wanting your product or service, right? And guess what? Listing on Australia's largest online directory is free. So... You don't really have any excuses. After the show, head over to yellow.com.au to give yourself the best shot at getting found online. Now, I'm guessing your business has many needs. Maybe you need extended cash flow to bring to life that genius marketing idea you've been sitting on for way too long. Or maybe you'd love a rewards points program that had you flying at the pointy end of the plane on the trip of a lifetime. Maybe you're just like a business tool that made running that beautiful business of yours just that little bit easier. Well, here's what I'd do. After the show, check out American Express's range of business cards designed specifically to help small business. Simply Google Amex Business to find out more. Thanks to Yellow Digital Marketing Agency, Yellow American Express and Authentic Education, we're chatting with serial entrepreneur Carl Hartman. Now, Carl, top five learnings on how to grow and scale a business. I reckon we'd all love to hear what you have to say in that regard. So, top uh, five. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I think I might steal some from my lectures because they're, <laughs> they're, uh, uh, it's front of mind. Um, so, look, um, first thing I always say is focus, right? Um, and, um, you know, the main reason for focus is, particularly when you're a first-time founder, 
everything is new and exciting. Um, you know, you'll go and speak to a hundred different people. You get a hundred pieces of advice, like opportunities present itself and want to pull you in different ways. So I think one of the, the really important factors of being an entrepreneur is being able to see the tree from the forest. So, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, make your, make, like make a decision, lock it in. Um, and being able to sort of put the distractions, it's a lot easier said than done. Mm. Uh, it does get easier with experience. Uh, is there any tip on being focused? Just being brutal and, and actually saying. I mean, many business owners find it hard to say no to opportunities. Is it no, learning to no say is no. Is powerful. For, uh, or or um, yeah, look, there's probably three or four different strategies, but um, you know, one of the easiest way is just making a little matrix and you know, basically understand if its importance, right? And is it something that you have to do? So, you know, if it's important and it's urgent, uh-huh. right, do it now. And that's something you've got to do. Got if it. it's important and it's not urgent, you might be able to put it on the back burner or delegate it. So it's just, I guess, whatever is the right mechanism, it's um, probably just putting the right, um, you know, decision matrix and governance around yeah. your time yeah. uh, and finding the way to, uh, I guess, put things in the right boxes. So you can avoid rabbit holes because there's certain things that can just, uh, actually, let's make that the second one, <laughs> um, you know, because there's certain things that can just become complete time sinks, right? Yep. So your ability to uh, not get sucked into some of yeah. these, these things becomes really important. And, mm. um, you know, often you're in a meeting and you can just know that it's just consuming the conversation and it's not actually about the whole point of the meeting in the first place. So you just mm-hmm. got to be able to be a grown up and say, great topic, park that, let's just explore this separately and not go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that with interviews yeah. where you can you go off on a conversation, which is kind of interesting, but it's not what we're here to do. So it's kind of getting back online. Speaking of getting back online, number three. Number three, uh, I, I, I think this is a, it's in probably another iteration of focus, but uh, probably a bit more tactical. Um, I, I call it don't fight the war on too many fronts. So, you know, again, you can be, you know, you can, the world can be your oyster. You can have a big blue ocean of opportunity. Uh, at the end of the day, you need to be very uh, tactical in terms of where you go to market and because you've all got limited resources. So often when I see businesses come into trouble, they might be tr- like uh, trying to go to market um, with a very labor intensive model in five or six countries at once. I mean, you just simply don't have enough bullets in mm-hmm. that sort of scenario to continue with the analogy. Um, you know, or it, from a product, if you're a technology company, you might have five ideas. You've got enough resources to build one. Now, if you try to split your, your, your um, development capacity and try and say build two or three things in parallel, chances are you're probably going to know all of those are going to be substandard. You're better off just doing one extremely well, make it polished, moved on to the next thing. Talk so, about this a lot on this show where one can be a dangerous number in business, but one can also be an incredibly important number in business. Where yeah. you, you do, you focus on that. So you would, you would subscribe to doing one thing well as opposed to spreading your Many risk. Many things horribly, doing, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, and look, I think probably the best example I can give listeners is something like the Atlassian story. I mean, they started with Jira. They, um, that was pro- product one. And then what, they what's just, Atlassian? Atlassian's uh, Australia's biggest tech, tech company to date. Um, I, I would have to look up the market cap, but it's it's Big. listed on the Nasdaq and it's in the tens of billions now. They're doing wow. they're doing super well. But you know, if you know their story, um, you know, started with one product that gave birth to another, and they've just become a uh, you know uh, basically Atlassian's the software you use to if if you're building software. Uh, okay. and it's used by most of the you know the biggest tech companies in the world. Um, so yeah, it's definitely Australia's largest um, uh, I guess success story. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, there's there's definitely some lessons in both um, the way they've scaled their their execution and their commercial model for sure. Number four, Carl, how to grow and scale a business? Oh, look, I'm, I'm going to say uh, hire good people. Um, you know, entrepreneurship is, it's a team sport. Like any founder that thinks that they're this, like they might be the center of gravity within the company, but um, anyone that thinks they can get across the finish line is, uh, is very mistaken. Your ability um, as an entrepreneur to create a shared vision and rally a team around you um, is basically one of those make or break skills you either have or you don't. Mm -hmm. Um, But making sure those people around you, you know, uh, you know, uh, accretive to 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 completing the mission becomes super important. It's so easier said than done, though. Good people. We hear yeah. this all the time. You say any business owner out in the street, what's your greatest challenge? It's attracting and retaining great people. Hundred percent. And uh, you know, hopefully that that that's you know, I mean, that's why we created Shortlister. Um, speaking about that company, and you know, that's been designed to so even a small business that doesn't have a lot of budget for uh, 
you know, to bring in some, say, external HR talent or recruiters, you know, the, the first subscription there is free. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, people that need it the most can still get value from it. Mm. And obviously, you know, as, as you grow, um, you know, there's paid subscriptions as well. So there's a natural... Can you stop flogging your investments, please? <laughs> Number five. Uh, hey, I'm passionate about solving the <laughs> yeah, problem. Yeah, correct. Um, I'm going to say, like, uh, I say capital is oxygen. Um, so... Basically, in any business you're doing, you're going to need to be capitalized. Now, you can either bootstrap it, you know, reinvest all your profits back into the business um, and uh, and grow it that way. Otherwise, you're going to have to think about, you know, raising some capital from from one of the, the various sources of doing so. Mm-hmm. But getting that balance right is also important. Um, I can tell you some stories of when I lived in Silicon Valley, seeing some companies that raised monster rounds that basically died because they raised too much money. Wow. Because, it, 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 you know, it's it just they weren't very... Uh, What's the right word? Frugal? Um, yeah, frugal. Uh, capital efficient is probably the technical term. Um, they were spending money on things that they definitely shouldn't have spent money on, thinking that, you know, oh, we'll just raise another round. And to be honest, if you don't live up to – if you raise a big round at a big valuation and you don't live up to the growth hype, there won't be a second round. No, no, no. no so, I, I, like I always say, like that's why I like the oxygen analogy because – you know, um, if you don't have any oxygen, you'll suffocate and die. But if you have too much oxygen, it can actually, ex- you know, explode. Hmm. So it's just getting that 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 fuel mix right, so you can basically get up into orbit and, uh, you know, uh, orbit the Earth uh, with perpetual motion. That's um, that balance becomes really important. Having interviewed close to five hundred successful business owners, I'm often asked, what traits do they have in common? Two that come to mind immediately are their deep respect for the power of marketing and their solid commitment to never, ever stop learning. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about an upcoming one-day marketing course being hosted by Authentic Education, which is a BRW Fast 100 company. Happening around Australia in June and July 2019, amongst other things, if you attend, you will discover six steps to nailing your Facebook ads, high converting copywriting techniques, a formula for writing email subject lines with ridiculous open rates, a simple $20 a month marketing hack that can generate multiples, you'll get some social media training and plenty more. So if the idea of getting a grip on your marketing appeals, and I know it does because you're listening to this show, then take a day out of your crazy schedule and go and learn something new to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. You can find all the details out about that course, that one-day course, over at authentic.com.au forward slash Timbo. That's authentic.com.au forward slash Timbo. Carl, uh, great tips on on scaling and growing a business. Um, just to finish, you spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. You've spent a lot of time in that kind of crazy part of the world where excess and extravagance must just be, uh, you know, part of the day. You know, part of walking along the street. Anything you can, any story you can tell, something you oh, saw. I've got one good story. So um, uh, we were, we were a Salesforce customer. I went to the Salesforce, um, you know, conference, um, you know, every year. And one year, U2 was playing. And, uh, uh, really? And, yeah, at their, at their party. I mean, the production value of this conference, you know, measured in well into the millions. Uh, this is Dreamforce. And uh, I went along. And would you believe there were some, some young kids in front of me and they were on their phone. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're at the, we're at the work party. <sighs> some Irish band is playing. <sighs> and I was like... Come on, doesn't everyone know you too? Isn't yeah. that one of those transgenerational bands? But you, you scratch your head and saying, okay, there's some right. education to do because okay. it's another world. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's amazing. They've had like at some of their events, they've had U2, they've had Metallica. Like it's, you know, it, it, it's... That's big. Yeah, they've just built this massive new uh, uh, skyscraper. Uh, I think that was a billion dollar building. Salesforce have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. It's one of the biggest towers in the skyline now <laughs> just to house all their employees. But, you know... They, they're a super successful company and they've got the market cap to support it. Why not? Know, all employees need a home, don't they? <laughs> Anything crazy? I mean, I just imagine the menus over at cafes and restaurants in Silicon Valley would just be ridiculously, have ridiculous things on them and oh, ridiculously look, priced yeah, they're, they're, they're and, and the cars some... that are driving up and down the main drag. Are... It's probably not as much as you think. Right. I mean, there are some places that have like the $100 burger, but um, no, look, it's because the nature of, uh, it's probably one of my, 
uh, ob- you know, the things you'll observe going to somewhere like San Francisco is the inequality of, we- of wealth is actually uh, pretty massive. So the haves have a lot and the, and the have-nots have nothing. Mm. So you actually can get both extremes in a very uh, short distance. So, you know, and a lot of the really successful people, they keep a super low profile. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they might have billions of dollars, but they'll, they'll drive a Tesla, um, you know, because one, because it's electric and two, because they don't stand out. Um, mm. And uh, three, because a lot of the roads have potholes. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I had a buddy with a Maserati and he only drive it a couple of times a year because, oh, you know, the rings can't take potholes. Is he okay? Is he okay about that? I mean, you know, if you need to call me, just have a, you know, a bit of a whinge. <laughs> hey, Carl, that's awesome, mate. Exciting stuff. Uh, you got some great business. It can, have you got a personal brand website or something people no, can find no. out? Just your LinkedIn or LinkedIn's something, I suppose. Good. Shortlister, yeah, I'm... Liars. <laughs> Tomando's no good anymore. <laughs> What's the wakeboard company? Uh, Radden. Yeah, Radden. That, that one's fun. <laughs> What's the next one? Anything sort of, oh. can you make an announcement right now? Oh, the couple other companies I'm looking at, but um, I think in terms of, I think I've founded enough, you know, or co-founded enough with, uh, of uh, primary projects for now. Um, I'm, I'm also on a, on a board of one in the UK, which is an AI cross-border platform, um, does right. product classification, duties and taxes. So, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, just, well, e- e-commerce is one of my, my uh, areas of interest because, uh, right. you know, anything you can do to make global trade easier has a lot of economic benefit. Awesome, buddy. <laughs> uh, serial entrepreneur, evangelist, uh, wakeboarder extraordinaire, <laughs> Carl Hartman, thanks for joining us on the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Thanks for having me, Tim. What a guy. So many solid learnings right there. Carl Hartman, serial entrepreneur. Hey, thanks to American Express Digital Marketing Agency, Yellow, and Marketing Educators Authentic Education. Here's what grabbed my attention from that chat with Carl. Attention grabber number one, be an evangelist for your business. If you can't, then maybe it's time to reset your mindset or get out and do something differently. The fact that Carl feels like he needs to be able to evangelize everything about any business he gets involved with clearly is a key success factor for him. Attention grabber number two, I really love Carl's generosity for giving back, whether it be through his adjunct professorship at Queensland University or simply allowing would-be entrepreneurs to pick his brain. It's just great to see people who have made it like Carl willing to give back. And I know I've seen him at work. He's a very generous guy. Attention grabber number three, stay focused by avoiding rabbit holes. Putting two of his tips together there. Love this. Focus is everything. Rabbit holes are dangerous. You can break your ankle when you trip down a rabbit hole, but they also take your mind off the game big time. I'm a bit of a shocker for rabbit holes. They're a bit like bright, shiny objects. They sort of, you know, they take your eye off the game, you lose focus, and the next thing you know is like, why isn't my business working as well as it should be? So staying focused, great tip. Love to know what grabbed your attention. Maybe there's one in there, one of Carl's tips challenged you. Maybe you've got a question for Carl. Put it in the show notes. I'll get him to respond. Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 463 is where you can do that. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. Oh, yes, indeedly, doodly. It is that time of the show to reward a motivated listener for taking some serious marketing action as a result of listening to this show. Today's winner is... Lane. Haven't got a surname. I'll talk about that in a minute. Of trackabout.com.au, which are the manufacturers of off-road campers and trailers. Nice little business. Had a look at his website. Uh, Lane, well done, buddy. I'm about to read what Lane's done. But Lane, I've got a bone to pick with you. I have no idea what your surname is. There was nothing in the email signature. I went to trackabout.com.au, looked, went to the About Us page. Not even a picture of your mate. No surname. You, even, you're not, you don't mention yourself. Went to the Facebook for Trackabout, nothing there. I just couldn't find it, mate. Personalize your business. It would be another tip that you could take from this show. Put a face to the name. Anyway, I'm being a bit harsh because Lane has taken some serious marketing action. Here's what he says. <clears throat> and I clear my throat as I'm about to read Lane's email. Hey, Timbo, I stumbled across your podcast about two months ago, and I believe in credit where credit's due. Too often, people will only reach out about the bad in life, but your podcast is killing it. Lane, thank you for that. 
<laughs> As a result, you win lots of prizes. No, you do, you've done more than that to win the prizes. But I agree. Reach out when people are doing good stuff, not just when you've got something to complain about. Lane goes on to say, I'm the son of a family business making top quality Aussie made camper trailers in a very tough environment with huge competitors and cheap, nasty imports. Every morning, how's this? I love this. I get up, I jump in the car, and I head to work 30 minutes early listening to your podcast. I get there, I write down every little idea that popped into my head in my little green book. I like the fact that you've got a journal going, Lane. I think maybe there should be a small business big marketing journal that I can sell and make, you know, like get really rich so that every single listener has one. I like that idea. I'm going to do that. Maybe. It's like a Spyrex pad. <laughs> Sell it for 50 bucks. And go back to, uh, the, back to Lane. And then do my job running production. Jump back in my car. Listen to your podcast on the way home. Get home. Scribble more ideas down and have a chat with my partner. She works in marketing herself about what you spoke about in the episode and what we can implement. Lane, you are a dedicated fan. I'm honoured to be awarding you some prizes. He goes on to say, thanks to you, I've got some really exciting, cheap and personalised online marketing ideas, including adding to our glowing Google reviews, increasing organic traffic to our website, we seem to go really well for a small business, through to blogs and customers sharing their story on video about our brand and product and the way they experience it. We also do an online video series called The Explore Life. Mate, you are smashing it, Lane. Anyway, he says, I've got to run. I've got plenty of work to do. Lane, trackabout.com.au. That is awesome. This is why I do the Monster Prize Draw. I love hearing what you guys get from this show and are implementing. It's all very well to listen to the show. I love that. But if I know you're implementing, that motivates me to do more. Lane, for your troubles, your efforts, here's what you've won. A full range of liars, non-alcoholic spirits. That's valued at over 500 bucks. A $50 Sendal voucher. $100 voucher to buy some undies from Tradies. $50 voucher to buy some PJs from Santa Abel. Maybe they're for your, your wife. I don't reckon you'd be a, a PJ wearing kind of guy, Lane. $75 City Larder voucher. My DNA test kit valued at 99 bucks. $75 to use at snottynoses.com.au. $75 bucks to use it on the go merchandise. You get promotion on this show, which I've already given you, plus a backlink in the show notes, which Google love. Thanks, Lane. Uh, everyone else, send me, an, send me an idea that you've implemented from listening to the show to tim at timreid, R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. hundred words or less. You know, it's like, hey, Timbo, I listened to your show. I got this idea from it. I implemented it. And this is the impact it had on my business. See ya. That's all you got to do. And you win. That almost wraps up episode 463 of the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show. Thanks to digital marketing agency Yellow, Small Business Marketing Educators Authentic Education, and American Express. You can check out Yellow's suite of products to get you found online over at yellow.com.au. And I would encourage you to go to Authentic's upcoming marketing training. It's a one-day course. It's free. And it looks like they're going to cover some really good stuff, as per the interview I did with the owner of Authentic, Cham Tang, only last week. Go to authentic.com.au forward slash Timbo. Uh, Check out Amex's sweet range of business cards by searching Amex Business. They've got some pretty cool cards. Get lots of points. Go on a holiday. You can. Can't promise it, but you could. Hey, next week, we catch up with the inventor of the round beach towel. Like, it only got invented six years ago. Like, how does that work? You'll find out next week. Don't forget there's an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you love the show, just go and let some other business owners know. That's all I want you to do. Until next week, I am Timbo Reid. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the absolute best marketing. Bye for now.